Hello everyone, welcome back to our monthly Q&A video series, where I, Kyungwa Kang, Global President of Asia Society, answer your questions. For this month, Polonia on X asked, and I quote, most East Asian countries are facing the problem of low birth rates, which may hinder economic growth and cause social problems. It seems that each country is responding through various policies, but I am curious what Asia society's opinion is." Unquote. Thank you for the question on a very complicated matter, which many countries around the world, and not just in East Asia, are struggling to come to grips with. Let me first say that Asia society has so far not been deeply engaged in the issues related to demographic trends. But clearly, dropping birth rates is a shared concern across many countries in the Asian region. And Asia society hopes to more actively participate and add value to the policy discussions on this challenge. In the meanwhile, I agree with the need for a new approach to the challenge. As outlined in the report, Demographic Change and Sustainability, recently published by the United Nations Population Fund. The report confirms a steadfast trend towards below replacement fertility around the world, with pockets of high fertility remaining in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in some Southwest Asian countries. Globally, the fertility rate has gone from 4.84 in 1950 to 2.23 in 2021, and is projected to be 1.5 in 2100. And indeed, East Asia, along with Eastern Europe, is seeing the lowest fertility rates in peacetime in human history. My country, South Korea, is at the extreme end, with the world's lowest fertility rate at just 0.72 in 2023, and projected to fall even further to 0.68 this year. Japan, Taiwan, and China also have fertility rates far below the replacement level of two children per family to maintain a stable population. Why is this happening? Researchers point to a number of factors driving this trend. Urbanization, rising education levels, women's economic empowerment and growing social status, and even climate change. And every country has its unique circumstances as well. For example, Asia Society Policy Institute recently published a paper on why China's youth are deciding against having children, in which it notes the lingering impact of the one-child policy, later marriages, and economic uncertainty. Whatever the combination of these drivers, governments are struggling to reverse the trend. But after spending hundreds of billions of dollars on incentives, childcare and education subsidies, housing subsidies, to encourage young women and couples to have children. The conclusion seems to be that the policies have been largely ineffective. Instead, as UNFPA recommends, a better approach would be to see the challenge not as a problem to solve, but as an inevitable process of demographic transformation, including aging population and migration. And seen in this light, Policies should not, in the first instance, be about how to fix populations demographically, but how to enable the best possible prospects for all people, the young, people of working age, and older people, with close attention to the changing age structure. Demographic change and diversity should be regarded as an integral part of shared human existence to move away from top-down demographic control to rights-based, non-discriminatory, human-centered policies that harness the potential of population change. But unpacking this approach and putting it into practice will require a mindset change among policymakers and learning best practices from one another. Well, that's a short reply to a complex question but I do hope it contributes to a new way of thinking about the low fertility challenge. Thank you and see you next time.